thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about this. And um, uh, I thought I'd just kind of kick off with um, you know, why one would like to do large prospective studies and also um, talk about, beyond UK Biobank, the need to do these studies in a range of different populations. Um, but before talking about the prospective studies, I, I, th I thought it would be worthwhile kind of um, mentioning the value of, of retrospective studies where you take people with a particular disease uh, and compare them with, with controls. And obviously, you know, one of the big advantages of that is uh, you know the people who've got disease, you can accrue large numbers, um, and you can accrue large numbers um, with particular characteristics, uh, those who are much younger, for example. And that can be quite important in understanding uh, how uh, strong the associations um, of a risk factor are with disease and what the impact is at a population level. So when one goes back to kind of Richard Doll's work or, or other uh, prospective cohorts that had looked at smoking, um, it was generally believed that the effect of smoking on coronary heart disease was to increase the risk by about two, two and a half fold. The problem with the prospective study, though, is that most of the people who developed the condition um, in a prospective cohort will be the older ones. So your kind of overall average will be the association largely dominated by the association at older ages. And the advantage of a retrospective study is you can get often a large enough number of people um, at younger age. And when you do that, uh, for example, in this retrospective study we did in MI, what you find is that um, uh, smoking is much more important than had been thought to be the case based on the, the prospective studies. So it isn't that prospective studies are the best. Um, it, it can depend on what one's trying, uh, trying to do. Uh, and so, for example, if smoking is twice as important as we thought as a cause of heart disease, uh, heart attacks under the age of 50, then when you attribute you look at the attributable uh, effect in the population, it means about 80% of heart attacks among men in Britain uh, under the age of 50 would, have, would not have occurred in the absence of smoking. So, so it really, um, to know that an important risk factor is twice <laughs> as important as you thought uh, uh, is a key thing to, to do. And particularly in the kind of genetic era, the anxiety around retrospective studies that the disease itself will change the risk factor you're studying is, all, is obviously uh, less of, a, of an issue. With smoking, one always has the problem, of course, that uh, one ha might have reverse causality, particularly if you assess smoking a long time after, uh, after the event. Um, but with genetics, it's unlikely that there'll be much material bias uh, introduced by the fact that someone has had a, a disease. I guess you can make arguments around case fatality, but it tends not to be an important um, problem. Uh, and I think that if one goes back to the kind of early days of the candidate genes, uh, a lot of the argument um, that uh, occurred around people claiming this candidate gene was associated with risk and then the next paper said no it isn't and then the next paper said yes it is and then the next paper said no it isn't and then I think Nature Genetics said enough, don't send me any more of your papers uh, on candidate genes in retrospective studies. Um, and there was all this stuff about you know, are the controls the right controls and I think actually if you look back what you find is the problem were was that these studies were too small and there was a lot of um, uh, multiple testing going on. <coughs> if we take the, the kind of poster child of the, the, the um, GWAS studies, the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, where they took seven different conditions, 2,000 cases of each and 3,000 controls, um, one gets a sense, I think, of how lucky we were. So particularly in coronary artery disease, there was one hit. So with 2,000 cases and 3,000 controls, one hit in coronary artery disease. Um, if we'd been a little unluckier, that one hadn't come through, then maybe there wouldn't have been uh, more funding uh, in this area. Um, if, however, you go to larger numbers, if you go from 2,000 up to 60,000, then in terms of the numbers of hits, you go from one to all of these being uh, genome-wide uh, significant. So I think illustrating the, uh, the beauty of numbers, that if you have large enough numbers of cases. And in the early days of this, another kind of argument, and a lot of time was spent, 
in defining you know, well, what's coronary artery disease, what's an MI. There was a lot of focus in each of these individual studies on defining what the cases were, and it turned out to be that was a, actually a wasted effort because what really mattered was to do bigger studies and not to get too hung up on the, the characterization of you know, what was a coronary event. But the advantage of prospective studies is you can avoid the reverse causality issue. And particularly if we're interested in not just genes, but genes environment interactions, then we do want to do that. We can be pretty assured that the controls uh, are from within the same kind of population, so we minimize uh, confounding. Um, and although they're very inefficient in the short term, you have to study quite large numbers, um, and most of the people that you study won't actually be informative about any particular condition. Of course, unfortunately, as we heard from Chris Whitty, all of us, or all of the people in such studies, will be inf informative about many conditions uh, in the long run. So um, if you're trying to build a resource for studying the determinants of disease, in the long term, uh, prospective studies are very cost effective. You can look at the effect of a single exposure on many diseases or on or many exposures on a single disease. But they need to be large. Um, and I wanted to illustrate how large. So what we did was we brought together some 60 prospective cohorts um, with a dozen years of follow-up and had a total of a million individuals in those 60 studies uh, looking at the association of known risk factors, uh, so blood pressure against coronary heart disease mortality on the y-axis, subdivided by age at risk. And so we've got a very strong risk factor for a common condition, and still it's a blur. Yeah, there's a kind of general upward trend, um, but you can't really determine the shape of the association with 5,000 people. So this is the Framingham study scale. This is what, for a long time, our GPs were using to determine, well, you know, you should lower your blood pressure. But should you do it when you're young or old? What's the, what's the pattern? So if you kind of focus it a little bit more, take randomly 50,000 out of this million individuals, it starts to come into focus. The so confidence intervals start to come, uh, become narrower. But is there a J-shaped curve at younger age? Does it flatten off? at older age, and for a long time, uh, it was believed that um, higher blood pressure at older ages was not associated with increased risk. Focus the whole thing with half a million individuals, and you get these beautiful log linear associations because it's a doubling scale. Steeper at younger age, so in relative terms, an interaction, uh, stronger association at younger age. But the absolute risk is obviously higher at older age, so in absolute terms, the interaction is the other way around. But you see these continuous relationships, I think, illustrating the power of scale. So do we just do one study in one population? Well, I would argue not. I mean, obviously, if you have more than one study, you can do replic replication. But the, the other thing is that half a million is not enough. Um, you know, that was... And a strong risk factor for a common condition, and only then do you start to be able to look at interactions. So combining very large studies is likely to al allow us to look in greater detail at the interactions and at less common uh, conditions. But actually heterogeneity may be our, our um, ally. The genetic heterogeneity may allow us to study um, the determinants of disease uh, in one population that we couldn't in another. And diseases that are rare in one population may be common in another. So it may well be uh, that going and doing a study in another population would actually be more informative about our own population because the condition is more common there. And I've often made this argument to the British Heart Foundation that if you wanted to study stroke, don't study it in Britain, study it in China. It's much more common in China. They've argued that we get our money from Britain, and so I've said, what, you're happier to fund research on British rats than Chinese humans? Um, and uh, they have kind of sh changed their policy to some extent. But you know, the, the value of looking across the world uh, to understand the full range of exposures um, is really important. If we want to know about smoking, you can't study pe people who are all smoking. 
you need some non-smokers. So if we want to study the British population, we actually need to compare ourselves with a normal population in terms of low lipid levels or low BMI. So it is this opportunity to study a much wider range of exposures um, that I think gives us much more information about risk factors in our own. And it's this heterogeneity that's important in these studies. So, you know, if you look um, at the uh, different rates of disease in different populations, one can see where one would go if one was interested in studying, say, esophagus cancer or COPD or, or stroke. And even within a population like China, there's very large variation across China in terms of the rates of disease. This is showing esophagus cancer in females and males. Um, in different villages across China compared with the rates in the UK. And so, you know, China is not one big block, not even genetically, but also in terms of uh, its risks or its risk exposures in, uh, uh, environmentally or in, in diet. So my colleague, uh, Zengming Chen, worked with the Chinese Academy of Medical Science to recruit half a million people <clears throat> in 2004-2008 ask questions, make measurements, take samples, and then link them in to the health insurance scheme uh, that has been established in China uh, to um, find out what happened to them in the long term. <clears throat> and just kind of one interesting observation that has come out of this, uh, relating uh, BMI to risk factors uh, to, uh, to stroke. So here we have different measures of adiposity in this study uh, associated with blood pressure, as one would expect. Here we have blood pressure and the associations with stroke, ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke, as we would expect. So higher adiposity is associated with higher blood pressure, higher blood pressure associated with higher risk of ischemic stroke and even higher risk or relative risk of hemorrhagic stroke. QED, higher BMI, will produce higher risk of ischemic stroke, and that's what we see. But surprisingly, that's not the case for hemorrhagic stroke. So increased adiposity, which is increasing blood pressure, is not producing an increase in hemorrhagic stroke. No idea why. But I think it illustrates the opportunity to kind of um, uh, have large enough numbers to then start to unravel you know, what's going on here. What's the protective effect that BMI is producing on hemorrhagic stroke that is outweighing the adverse effect on blood pressure? Again, you know, we want to look at um, uh, leanness or, at, or, or, or not leanness. Um, we need to look at different populations. So if we, if we want to find out where we should be, we go to rural China. If we want to see where we're going to go, we can go to Mexico City. So here's a study that was done with the Mexican Ministry of Health. Um, here's the BMI in the women and the men in middle age, around 40% or more of women uh, have uh, a BMI over 30. The rates of diabetes compared with the US, massively higher rates of diabetes. And then one, one, one looks at what is the impact uh, on uh, mortality, then we've got something like a 30-fold increase in the risk of death from renal causes um, uh, under the age of 60 due to diabetes secondary to obesity. Um, and twice the relative risk for cardiac diseases that one sees typically in developed populations. And in absolute terms, about 40% of deaths in Mexico due to diabetes. Um, and the distribution quite different from what you'd expect in uh, richer countries, a very substantial proportion of that relating to death from renal causes, because in a place like Mexico, if you get renal failure, 
then the opportunity for dialysis and transplant is not there. And it turns out that although the diabetes is diagnosed, it's not well controlled. So the um, HbA1c levels are much higher than one would see in Western populations. And in addition, uh, cardioprotective drugs like statins, blood pressure lowering treatments are not being used extensively uh, in these people with diabetes, going again to Chris Whitty's comment about comorbidities and thinking about how one might uh, reduce risk by a number of incremental effects. So in terms of thinking about, you know, how do you improve the opportunities for um, uh, doing research in these cohorts, I think the key thing is to, we need to establish several large-scale cohorts in different environments with very detailed phenotyping, at least in large subsets, um, and with repeat assessment over time to be able to take account of uh, variation in those risk factor levels, and with centralized uh, approaches to identifying and phenotyping uh, the health outcomes in detail. The problem of prospective cohorts often is that one has to link to health record systems and often the, the detail about uh, the health outcomes is not uh, as good as one would like. And finally, making sure that those resources can be used by the widest range of researchers. So that was really the background uh, to the Wellcome Trust and the MRC uh, supporting the establishment of UK Biobank. Uh, with half a million people, with questions, measurements, and samples, with consent for follow-up through all the health records, and for use by all health researchers. And then they have supported additional characterization of the participants with internet diet diaries, cognitive assessments, uh, with a panel of assays, lipids, hormones, metabolic assays on all half million individuals, and the advantages of doing those assays on everybody is that you uh, protect the resource for the future. Um, so it reduces depletion and increases accessibility. So, because if one instead does uncontrolled assays, it'll rapidly deplete the resource. If you do case control assays within a cohort, then you can't compare the cases that you've analyzed at one point with some particular analyte with the cases that you analyze at another time because you'll have shifts in the, the assay methodology. Whereas if you do the assay on everybody, then you can always do a like-for-like -like comparison. And in fact, you can uh, do the assays in a random sequence across the whole cohort to ensure that there are no systematic biases in the assay. But of course, to, to measure anything on half a million people, however inexpensive that is, will be a large sum of money. So the question is, you know, can one make the case for, for investing that uh, funding? And I think the biggest case for it is that if you make the resource available to many researchers, then a lot of research will come out of it. Uh, and so that actually the, the, the cost per piece of research will be relatively low. All of the participants have been genotyped and indeed um, by making these data available not only to academia but to industry researchers, uh, industry is now stepping in as a funder uh, and they are funding exome sequencing in the whole cohort and those data will be available to all researchers as well. And I, w I just wanted to show one uh, result that's come, come out of this. This is from Seth Catherison at the Broad <coughs> Institute. Um, and just showing the uh, apologenic score uh, for uh, coronary heart disease risk and making the point that you can identify using this polygenic score quite a substantial proportion of the population that have a risk equivalent to being a, 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 an FH heterozygote. So already these genetic scores are, are showing their value in a general population um, for identifying people who, um, on the basis of other known risk factors, would not appear to be high risk, but on the basis of their genetic risk factors, uh, they are, and where they could get targeted treatment. 
And about 100,000 of the participants have worn accelerometers. Uh, and a nice piece of work done by uh, Aidan Doherty, um, working with Apple, um, looked at the value of that more detailed um, information about activity. So we know that there are certain questions if you ask people, they lie. Um, how much alcohol? How much activity? Um, uh, and so you've got a lot of error in the measurements you get. So this is a, a GWAS um, going down in this case against self-reported activity and you can see there's no hits. By comparison, if you compare it with the accelerometry data, you get some very strong uh, signals uh, coming through. So indicating the value of more specific assessment, more accurate assessment of, of some of the um, uh, lifestyle uh, exposures. And we're currently um, imaging 100,000 people. We started uh, uh, in Stockport. Um, we've now imaged nearly 25,000 people. A second imaging center is running in Newcastle. Uh, a third is opening uh, shortly in Reading, and then a fourth in Bristol. And the intent is to image 100,000 people over the next uh, few years, and then to re-image about 10,000 of them to be able to look at change in imaging, particularly with a focus on uh, dementia research. Why might imaging be interesting? Well, for example, we know that, as I in presented earlier, body mass index is an important uh, predictor of risk. Here's body mass index against stroke and coronary heart disease in uh, the million people I mentioned, very strong log linear associations above 22. But body mass index is a very poor indicator, actually, of fat distribution. So uh, a, uh, uh, these are two pictures from Jimmy Bell at Hammersmith. People, uh, similar age, gender, body mass index, estimated body fat, but with about threefold differences in internal fat based on imaging analysis. So body mass index is a very strong predictor of risk. Then think what the more direct measure of what you're trying to get at and fat distribution or other kinds of uh, indicators of, of adiposity uh, could be. And these are some of the data uh, that are emerging from UK Biobank of body mass index versus uh, various kinds of fat. Here's subcutaneous fat where body mass index is pretty good. Visceral fat where it's not quite as good. You can see the uh, correlation. And then liver fat where it's really quite poor. So it'll be really interesting when we start to get enough people who've had these an analyses done uh, to look at how that predicts uh, a variety of diseases. Then finally, my focus up till now has been about phenotyping the participants, but what about phenotyping the outcomes? And retrospective studies tend to focus on well-phenotyped uh, disease outcomes, whereas prospective studies uh, phenotype the participants and what we need to do is phenotype their outcomes better. But if we're going to have half a million people, we're going to have tens of thousands of outcomes that we need to detect and then phenotype. Uh, and there really are no large-scale approaches to that. Why might it matter? Well, you enhance the power to detect associations if you have more precise um, uh, phenotyping of the outcomes. Uh, and more specific uh, phenotyping of the outcome. So here's an example, breast cancer. If you look at reproductive measures, then there are very different associations between tumors that have hormones on the, the, uh, the tumor versus those that don't. If you couldn't subdivide these, then you wouldn't be able to see that clear distinction. So the approach that we've been taking in these large prospective studies is first you need to link. So you can link in the, in the UK to death, cancer, hospitalization, primary care data. Web-based questionnaires to participants can be used to pick up uh, suspected cases. Then cross-reference between different health record systems to, get, um, to check uh, caseness. And then look at whether one can go even further for particular outcomes, clinical records, imaging, tumor, uh, to uh, subclassify diseases. But as I said, there are no established processes. So this is an informatics problem 
uh, that we're creating that we need solutions to. And then finally, I just wanted to talk about the, the beauty of the systems in the UK. We have this ability to link in to health record systems that can tell us about uh, the long-term effects. Um, this study, the Million Women study, which recruited 1.3 million women through the breast cancer screening um, uh, service, uh, has now got 24,000 incident dementia cases. The thing about dementia, though, is it has a very long um, period where uh, subclinical disease is actually changing people's um, behavior. A and in order to avoid reverse causality, you actually need very long-term follow-up in order to, re to exclude the first decade or so where that reverse causality is occurring. And I just wanted to draw your attention to this. There's often been a, a claim that activity is a determinant of dementia. And what it is, is reverse causality. If you exclude the first 10 years, then there's absolutely no association between activity and, and any kind of dementia. Whereas the, the other associations come through very clearly, and you get very nice distinction between vascular and non-vascular dementia. So in conclusion, the kind of I issues that we've been considering are the generalizability, that you need to in, uh, have heteroneity with studies in lots of different populations in order to be able to generalize widely. Scalability, to do these studies at scale, requires not just scientific input, but an industrial approach. Uh, in making these things work, one needs to think about what one would like to do in the future, but not necessarily do it. Um, uh, focus on what needs to be done now. Uh, and of course, to do anything on this scale requires the kind of support that uh, UK Biobank has been blessed with from people like the Wellcome Trust, the MRC, and more recently, uh, BHF, CIUK, Diabetes UK, NIHR, the Department of Health, the Scottish and Welsh Governments. Thank you very much. Thank you.